All right, we're back here on the Chase Almost Podcast. We're taping this on a Wednesday afternoon with Edgar Thompson of the Orlando Sentinel. Edgar, good afternoon, sir. How are you? Doing great, man. I actually didn't tell you this beforehand. I'm on day seven of COVID recovery. Oh, no. First, first day, I actually feel normal and actually might even take a little bit of a walk. Mm-hmm. And I'm a guy who like lives in the gym and all this stuff, so... That'll tell anyone who knows me and knows that I have just, res- I'm just thinking of taking a walk. Mm-hmm. Will would know this isn't anything to be messed with, man. I know everybody hears it, thinks it. It's it just it's just a time suck, man. It's an energy suck. It can yeah. be a lot worse for sure, but it's uh, it's pretty draining, man. So be safe out there, everybody watching this. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, absolutely, and it, the it's cases are, man. Yeah, it's it's up uh, here heading into June, um, and <clears throat> as a runner myself, like I I I know where you're coming from, where it's actually hard to get back and that kind of thing. It's it's not fun uh, to uh, fall out of that routine and fall out of that uh, just airspace that you you just don't occupy. You have to get it back, and it takes takes time. It takes what it takes. Uh, but it's also super hot, Edgar, and I just, I, it's, a, we skipped spring here in Knoxville. We just moved on. So now my runs, I have to be really careful when I do it because man, it, before you know it, it's just like that and it's 90 and I'm like, well, all right, I guess it's going to be like a 7 PM, 8 PM run tonight. We'll see how I'm going to figure this out. But I don't know. Are you only the gym or are you a runner too? Not really a runner anymore. But I'm more gym guy, uh, but you know I'm I'm big into circuits and things at this mm. point. So everything's pretty high intensity burst. So I will not be resuming those until I get back from dust and next week. But I will ease back into things. Hopefully as early as tomorrow, I'd like to get in there and maybe just get moving around a little. But anyway, man, that was just a p- PSA there. The, this thing is definitely spiking this latest variant and it's very contagious. The irony of it is I caught it from a 90 year old friend of mine. Oh, wow. Aren't we the ones supposed to be giving it to the nine year olds, but she's doing okay. Her husband hit him pretty good. He spent five days in the VA, 92 mm. years old. He's okay though. So that's the good news is this thing's a slap in the face versus the Joe Frazier left hook that the earlier variants had been. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, spring ball wrapped up here. We're moving towards summer and classes are done. Uh, Tennessee was late. I don't know when Florida officially got out, but that's something we have to monitor now because that affects the portal and when guys are enrolling and we're, we're on like enrollment watch for a lot of these schools now. And like, oh, this player can't do anything. It's like, why is JT not uh, JT Daniels, the quarterback at UGA? It's like, oh, he's he's finishing up his school. So he, he did a mini mester in uh, the winter. So he has to finish that up and then he can do it. It's like, there's just so much that we have to keep up with and so much to keep track of at this point. Are you at all a little overwhelmed with how much your jobs change covering the Gators with the portal and NIL and everything else? That is the perfect word for it. You wake up and you're like, where do I start? There's Mm. so many, there's so many, it can be paralyzing because you're like, okay, what should I be working on? What's the, because one thing we do here at the Sentinel, I'm based in Gainesville. I've been in Gainesville off and on since 2002 fall. So I'm just 20 years now. And I worked for the Palm Beach Post, covered five seasons. And I was in South Florida for about six years and I've been back. But I've always worked in newspapers that we are the paper of record to a degree. Like we're certainly not going to ignore important things, mm. but we're also not going to be like 24 seven sports or no on three. And these other, you know, um, media entities that just, it's like, you know, minute by minute, man, they're just pounding it out. What's happening. Yeah. I'm lucky in that respect because I get to dig in on some stories. I mean, that's kind of my best. I'm at my best when I'm taking on bigger picture stuff, profiles, things like that. So that's nice, but there's so many, there's especially now I got two new coaches too. I got Mm -hmm. a basketball coach, new football coach, Billy Napier, Todd Golden basketball, Kelly Ray Finley and women's basketball, which was a, an entity. Nobody cared about that. 
And now they do because of the success it had last season and her mm. in general. So there's all that. Plus, there's great Olympic sports programs here at Florida. I mean, it's one of the best athletic programs top to bottom there is. Mm. So there are all of those. And then, oh, yeah, NIL. Oh, yeah, yeah transfer portal. Plus, I cover golf for us. So the Florida swing's busy for me with Bay Hill, TPC. Oh, and I do Daytona for us, too. So I did Daytona <laughs> 500 for a week. And then I get the summer race. So I'm always got stuff going on. And it's like, where do you begin? But with the Gators in particular and football in particular, it's amazing. I mean, I talked to Scott Strickland yesterday. And <clears throat> this is predestined, you know, just to get kind of a handle on things. They're going to they're going to eliminate divisions. It sounds like for sure. They're trying to figure out whether the model is going to be seven rotating opponents, one permanent, three permanent, six rotating. I like that one. Mm. But then you got to figure out who's doing what. Does Tennessee stay on the Gator schedule in the 6 3? I think it should. Georgia certainly would. I think it'd be yeah. Tennessee and whomever. But I wouldn't pencil in Tennessee, Florida in that one. I. Oh, you I wouldn't would? be surprised if it's Tennessee Vander if Tennessee three would be like Vanderbilt, Bama, Bama. and maybe Kentucky. I don't think Florida. Really? Yeah, I don't think Florida is a guarantee. Gators? Okay, I mean that was a that became a pretty intense rivalry. Yeah, but before nineteen ninety two, when the divisions first formed, when the SEC expanded. Yeah, the, you know the first time. Um, they were. I could be wrong. I they, just you know, they barely played prior to that chase. Is yeah. And Auburn in Florida was a much bigger game. Mm -hmm. But does Auburn want to have Georgia, Alabama, and Florida? No. I, I joked with Strickland. No. I said, I got you, man. Don't worry. You got Alabama, Georgia, Oklahoma. You're good. And he laughed. So, you know, but. So you he sounds like, though, that it, the divisions is going away. Like the divisions. The divisions are going away because you're going to have 16 teams. And mm -hmm. then you're, it doesn't. You're even going to put more of a gap. Mm -hmm. like Auburn, Florida. They played going back to 1912. They used to play for years. Then the divisions came. They hadn't played Auburn, but twice since 2007, 11 and 19. Huh. Next one's 24. You mm. add another team in there in your division to play every year, and the gap even widens even farther for when you're going to rotate back in on certain opponents. So, Y'all never play Arkansas. I know that. Excuse <laughs> you, never, me? you never go to Arkansas. Like, in, go well, to Fayetteville. No. So, yeah. so the point being, I was in. I was at both Arkansas games they've played since God knows whenever, in 03, <laughs> and yeah. then one with McElwain in 16 with us, 31-10. But, but the point is, you'd even widen the gap more. So mm -hmm. they're going to get rid of divisions. They want teams to play each other more. SEC game Scott Strickland is like nine games is better in his opinion yep. because SEC against SEC gets eyeballs, revenues, interest, and players and coaches want to play those games more too. Yeah, that's something that fans miss. Is you would assume that you're like, oh, these Power Five coaches want to protect the bowl eligibility and they want to protect their their wins and stuff like that. That's not really how most of these coaches you talk to are up. Like they're up for Georgia, Oregon, right out the gate. No, let's see what we are because we can use that as a learning tool. A lot of it is like, well, we can see where we're at. It's like a good baseline. So when we're always playing up to competition, we can see where our season's going, where we're at as a program, but you don't really gleam anything when Tennessee opens with ball state, like hype is not over here. Like here's what I feel about my team. Now, nothing really changes and you don't really, it's just a, I get the money aspect and helping those smaller programs and giving them those checks and stuff like that. But man, what we learned in 2020 is, you know, it's fun. Florida Ole Miss out of the gate like that. That's fun. That's what fans want is the NFL does not do this situation where it's like, we're going to play the XFL or the USFL the first three weeks of the season, and then we'll kick off our NFL schedule. No, it's like we're starting and we're going to have games that you want to see right out of the gate. And to your point, SEC fans just want to see nine to 10. I would go up to 10. Like I would do 10 conference yeah. games. So and if you, if you have 12 though, mm -hmm. and you're going to have in the case of Florida, Florida state, yeah. the case of South Carolina, Clemson, the case of Kentucky, Louisville, mm -hmm. just to name a few scenarios. You in Oklahoma, would it keep Oklahoma state? I don't know, but probably not. Cause I don't think they're going to keep it either way. Probably because of the animus now. Between yeah. But the point being, so that wasn't a good example. Stick to my first three <laughs> matchups. You, that's a tough game. Mm -hmm. so that gives you ten. Then 
I think the thinking is play another group of, I mean, another power five in there. Mm -hmm. And then maybe you get a group of five or even an FCS. Maybe, I don't know, but maybe it's just 10 good ones. And then you get a wiggle room on two, yeah. but here's my problem. If I'm a fan, I want one of those period. Mm -hmm. That's all I want to pay for. I don't want to be paying what they're asking for season tickets and what, and they're going up. I mean, Florida's yeah. about to renovate the swamp. That's going to be the next project. The swamp needs about 250 to $300 million worth of work. Hmm. They're going to rip out bleachers and most of it chair backs. They can't put chair backs in the upper level because of the weight, mm. but they're going to, the bowl, which is significant is going to be chair backs now. You're going to get more room to spread out a little bit and breathe. You won't be sitting on these metal bleachers, you know, like sitting like this, you know, getting pushed around the whole game, uncomfortable four hour, five hour experience. Yeah. So, but you're going to have to pay. Yeah. Is my point. And the licensing fee, they call it whatever contribution, but it's just, it's the equivalent of the NFL licensing. Fees. Yeah. You're going to have to pay more. So I don't want to pay that to see Eastern Washington which is the November, October one game mm. and one time, maybe that's it. Yeah. One. And then otherwise I want to see sec teams or in this case this year, I want to see Utah opener. Yeah. USF even, which is week three. Good game. USF decent. I mean, they, you know, they're, they got a ways to go, but they're going to be eventually pretty solid program. So I could even live with USF, but to me, USF might be the bottom. Mm-hmm and forget Eastern Washington, but then what are you doing to those athletic programs? You're really, eventually, man, I mean, you've seen all this stuff. Swarbuck, uh, Jack Swarbuck last two weeks ago, talked to Pat Forty at SI. Yeah, He said by the time the SEC and the ACC and all these deals come up, the TV deals in mid-30s, they're going to be breakaway. But then, but then what do you get there? And then back to Scott Strickland, there might already be thoughts in the SEC of breaking away a little bit. That SEC playoff model is a dumpster fire. That needs to be ended at the door. Like that is not where we need to go whatsoever. Like I agree with the power five uh, only and the power five switching away because it's just the money. It's not the same. There's no, if you expand the playoff and you go to 12 teams, whatever it is, they don't have the bodies to withstand a perfect season and then win three power five games in a row. It's just, it's not realistic. They don't have the players. They don't have the fun. It, it'll never happen. There will never, college football was never built around the group of fives making this kind of amazing run and winning an, a national title. They're not playing the same game anymore. The boosters aren't the same. The NIL opportunities aren't the same. It's just two different worlds, but man, the, that would bum me out if we did an SEC there, national it championship. Happen. It's posturing. Yeah. I think Sankey's just like, okay, if you guys don't want to come to the table, mm -hmm. realistically talk about a 12-team playoff that's going to benefit all the leagues mm -hmm. and pr present an opportunity for group of five schools, also the better ones, which mm -hmm. ultimately are going to end up in some conferences right. as things go. Um, then what are we doing here? We'll just go do our own playoff. Problem is, how do you leave out Lincoln Riley USC? Mm -hmm. How do you leave out Mario Cristobal? You, Miami, I, that team, that program is going to get better. Mm -hmm. How do you leave out Ohio State? How do you leave out Clemson? Mm -hmm. How do you leave out Oregon if it can continue forward with Lanning, which I think it will? And the list goes on Penn State, Michigan. How are you leaving out those schools? You right. can't, but you can leave out probably a decent chunk of the ones that are in that mix. Mm. So I don't know, man. I mean, I come from Richmond. My dad loves UVA football and I have a bunch of friends who went to UVA. UVA not being in, in that whole mix. I mean, it's not going to be the end of the world for college football would probably be for Virginia. But anyway, the main point being, I don't think that it's going to be an SEC only deal, but they have leverage. Right. Because they can make a pretty dang good playoff in the SEC. I mean, people will watch. Mm. People in a certain part of the country will watch. <laughs> Maybe not uh, across. Yeah, you're the right. Country. Yeah, I agree. Um, I don't think it's a smart move. 
Yeah, well, we'll see what happens. There's still a lot to be decided at this oh, yeah. point, and I don't think it's going to be decided anytime soon. It no. sounds like there's going to be a lot more fighting and a lot more uh, crawling to the. They're just they're trying to do one step at a time. Like, let's get nil. Let's get the portal. Let's. I just there's a lot on the plate for nobody because there's no one to universally run this thing. So it's uh, different, varying degrees of states and legislators and uh, ads and goodness gracious, it's what a mess. Um, is the quarterback competition still open, Edgar, at the University of Florida? I mean, Anthony Richardson won the job during the spring game if he hadn't already had it. Jack Miller, the Ohio State transfer, was garnering some interest, you know, outside, you know, the program. Mm. Behind closed doors, we're not sure. Practices are – they're closed beyond closed, honestly. I mean, you get to see a little bit of a window at the beginning – but you can't discern anything there. Mm -hmm. So we saw the spring game, excuse me. And Jack Miller looked pretty erratic. And Anthony looked transcendent for two series at least. And and then from there it was okay. But he made enough of a statement those first two series where you were like, okay. He looked very in control, made quick reads, very accurate throws. And there was one instance, I think, where he ran, which is one of his great skills. And you were like, you know, nobody's beating this guy out. Mm -hmm. Now, the reality is he's going to have to stay healthy, which he wasn't able to do last season. He's a big bodied kid. He's 6'4", 237-ish. He is so almost so powerful for his body that you were talking about running mm -hmm. you know, or whatever. I mean, I exercise. You can only put so much stress on those joints no matter how young you are. And when he's just the explosiveness of a guy that size and strength, he almost like pulls things. I was mm -hmm. never fast enough to pull a hamstring. Well, he is, he's powerful. And so they got to monitor how his body, you know, reacts and things. And I know they're really digging in on the details and the data of how to do that and monitoring him because they got to keep him healthy. And it's going to be interesting because he's going to be carrying such the offensive load because he's really the one true playmaker on that offense you can rely on. There are a few others that could emerge, but he's the one guy. And he needs to be the real deal for this team to make headway because the schedule's brutal, man. Mm. And the offense is new and guys are going to be learning and they really don't have a whole lot of playmaking capability at this point. It's interesting. They're opening with – have they ever played Kentucky this early? Like week two? Oh, yeah, they play Kentucky in week two often. Is it week two? Why did I always think it was like later in the season? It's often that? week two or three, but three. the one they lost to Mullen – when Mullen lost, you remember, yeah. that was week two when Marco Wilson hmm. blew his knee out in 18. They played him in week two with McElwain in 16, hmm. beat him 45-7 here, really yeah. beat the doors off Stoops. Otherwise, that has been – they beat him pretty soundly in 2020. Other than 16 and 2020, that has been a tough game mm. ever since Mark Stoops has been there other than his first year. So three out of whatever the 10 meetings against Mark Stoops, it's been a pretty legit game for the Gators, and they're unlucky to win a number of them. So that's a tough week two game. And you follow, it's just two physical teams back to back, two well-coached physical teams right out the gate, which I love. Now, uh, as a Tennessee guy, like I love that just uh, heavy blows to the Florida Gators uh, right out the gate. I like that. But like you said, their schedule's tough, but I don't know. I wish Tennessee could get, if we could slide in to week three instead of week four, because I'm so tired of playing Florida in this early in the season. I'm so tired of it, Edgar. That's one of the things we move on. Like if we play Florida last year at the end of the year versus the beginning, it's, I think, a totally different story. It, it certainly and, is. And that was Florida's best game last year, probably. Emory was unstoppable. It's just third downs. He was converting over. He was just uh, death by a thousand paper cuts is what Dan Mullen did to uh, Tennessee in that one. But um, I'm I'm very curious because Vegas likes Anthony Richardson and they like Florida uh, in year one with uh, Napier and I'm just I'm very curious to see how What's this it? goes. Uh, what did you say? I saw BetOnline.org has this over under six and a half. I'd set it at seven and a half personally. I I wouldn't take six. Well, Fanduel had them as like the fourth best odds to win the SEC this uh, upcoming year. Fanduel I think had them at number four. Okay. So they're. 
it's basically like if Georgia doesn't win the SEC East, they have Florida as the next up to win the East, which is I don't, I don't buy that. Well, until Tennessee does it, until Tennessee just uh, expels those demons in Knoxville, and I, I just the the. Well, I don't even know if I buy it, Tennessee. I don't know. I don't know who it is, but it's. Oh, hard. you have the number two, Kentucky or South Carolina. I just don't know. It's hard. Look, any of them. Mm-hmm. In Florida, let's say all four of them, throw them in a hat. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing: is Florida's schedule though is the issue there? Yeah. Florida start open as we talked about. That September is brutal. Utah at home. Pac-12 champ, Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Kentucky's got some questions to answer, but but they're also always physical. They're a well-coached team, and it's a solid program now that's recruited pretty well, especially at Kentucky, very well. USF, athletic, they'll have some guys. Brought in and, the Baylor quarterback. And they're be- going to be better mm-hmm. than last year. Jeff Scott, I think people think, is a pretty good coach, and he's the program's improving. I mean, it, it was such a mess when he took it over mm-hmm. and then you go to tennessee i mean that's september for you that's a rough september then you get to october i think missouri's the you get eastern washington i think missouri i believe mm-hmm. missouri with Drinkwitz is not a it's a good it's a solid program okay maybe not forget them then mm-hmm. you got lsu though yeah there is a huge wild card i have no idea what to make of lsu my argument was in lsu by yeah. week Georgia at A and M. So That's you got rough. that three game stretch, and then you got that three out of four game stretch in September, and and you got South Carolina coming up in there too. It's like, it's just it's a rough schedule, man. So to think Florida is going to finish second based on the schedule, to me is, you know, in six and a half is the over under. I would still probably take the over, but if it were seven and a half, I'd probably take the under. Meaning, I think it's about a seven one team. Here. Well, I think a lot of it depends on what Richardson is. Like, if Richardson's healthy for go. 12 games and he's a Heisman-type guy, that changes everything and changes how we look at Florida completely. Indeed. Um, so we'll, that's just a, a big wild card. I'm curious, as someone who's covered them both, who? what are some early differences between Napier and Dan Mullen for you? Dan, Dan was kind of – I mean, he's very, very bright – and dan knows he's very very bright and which is fine i got along fantastic with dan i don't Mm -hmm. even mean that like it comes off like negatively but he was very confident in his intelligence his opinions his vision uh with the standalone facility that's going to be completed here in the next month or so dan had lots of input in that Uh, he was telling the architects how to do things (laughs) that's how he is he's kind of that smartest guy in the room guy and he yeah. often probably is. Well, Billy is a little more humble there, but you can tell he's very bright. The thing with Dan, though, is that intelligence level, and I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I've always been kind of quick with things. It leads you to a fly by the seat of your pants mentality, which is great. It's very well suited to journalism where you mm-hmm. get deadlines and you get something forcing you. And there's some days where, you know, you can kind of let a loose end or two fly and then you recover. You can't do that when you're running a college football program. And mm-hmm. I think that Dan, like, he, he thought he could scheme, game plan, play call you, adjust on you, and beat you like that and develop. Mm-hmm. And he was really good at it. So the recruiting apparatus, the overall organization at the – you know, foundational level, I think, had some creakiness to it. And he wasn't pushing for the support staff to the level Billy Napier is. The organizational effort was different. Billy has like 65 people on staff, man. (laughs) And he apparently comes into meetings. He writes everything down. I never saw Dan with a piece of paper, barely. Billy's always got a notebook. You go in his office, he's got books here and there. He had piles here when I went in and interviewed him one time. I'm like, what are those? Oh, and he's like, well, this is February of 2019. Here's February of 2020. Here's February 2021. And he's like, I'm looking at what we did each of those years and how we improved each year, what we learned from each year. And now there we were in February, of course. 
And now he's figuring out how I'm going to learn from all those missteps, mistakes, and things we did well too for this February. So he hyper organized. Um, and then he would come, he comes into meetings apparently, walks in the room, looks at his list, 60 people are packed in a room, like shoehorned in the room. And he's like, okay, recruiting, blah, 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 blah. All right, promotional marketing, blah, 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 blah. Okay, linebackers, blah, blah, blah. I mean, goes around the room, boom, boom, boom. The comment from one of them was like, within, within 15 minutes, he's given six weeks worth of workout. <laughs> and he is just very, Dan, I don't think operated that way. The mm. other thing is Dan to his failing was he was extremely loyal, mm -hmm. great quality. I'd known Dan since 2005 when he was here as a coordinator at age 33. Dan got off the plane, walked up to me, hit, slapped me on the shoulder, said, good to be nice to work with you again. I thought that was fantastic. I always have liked Dan, mm -hmm. but he was loyal to Todd Grantham, who was his neighbor. He was loyal to John Hevesy, who he'd been with since 2000, going back to Bowling Green with Urban Meyer. They've been together for all that time. Well, Hevesy couldn't land top recruits in the offensive line. Something needed to change there. Todd Grantham's defense in 2020 was, an, was historically bad. And Dan, I think, needed to move on from him after that season. He didn't, and it ended up biting him in the butt in 2021. And then when he was forced to make a move on those two guys, mm -hmm. that South Carolina game, I think he had it was already... Too late. He had already kind of checked out a little bit, I think, and was frustrated. And then at that point, it was just like, all right, whatever. That's he just interesting. Lost interest. Hmm. What do you, does it surprise you that he wound up as like a Lake Oconee uh, offensive analyst and that he's going to take some time with his family and hang out? Do you think that's a long term thing? Do you think he can stay away from uh, high profile coaching for the foreseeable future? Or do you think he's back in sooner rather than later? I mean, he's a competitive guy. I mean, he always talked about that. I'll take you on in thumb wrestling. You know, we do this, we do that. And I always wanted to play golf with Dan because I think mm. we're both equally kind of okay and bad, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Alternately, but it'd been a fun match. Um, he is competitive. So I wonder, but he also is very wealthy and he's very mm. family oriented. And he got a tremendous buyout here. He got a $3.6 million, you know, direct deposit roughly into his account within 30 days, six oh, wow. million right off the top after taxes, I figure about 3.6. So he didn't really have to do anything this year. And mm -hmm. he already had made a bunch of money. Plus they sold their house here, which is very nice. Hmm. So it's like good for Dan. If he wants to relax, regain some perspective, be around his kids and his wife, he and his wife have a fantastic relationship. I mean, it truly seems like a team over there with those two. And, you know, he's got a 12 and a nine year old or whatever they are. Mm. It's, you know, he wants to be a dad. Good for him if he's doing that. Now, do I think he's going to stay out of coaching long term? No. Do I think he might end up in the NFL? I don't know. I mean, that might suit his like personality. Did he ever talk about it? I mean, NFL stuff came up at times. Mm. Here's one thing Dan said a couple of years ago. There were some rumors, you know, I think it was more a leveraging ploy to get an extension. Mm. This is what we had heard. But the New York Jets mm. were interested in Dan Mullen. Well, I don't know that they necessarily were, but at least there might have been a conversation. And he said at the time when we asked him about it, he's like, you know, the college football landscape, man, is getting challenging. This isn't the same game that I came into, and it's changed a lot even in two years. Transfer portal, NIL, those two factors have completely changed the game. It's nonstop player movement, and it's helping players, you know, get deals, recruits get deals, managing all of that. Uh, you know, it is, it's, it's overwhelming for these guys and it's not something they signed up for. So I, I think Dan <coughs> was, um, kind of getting disillusioned with that too. And then COVID hit and it just, it had an impact on that guy, man, whether it was the A&M game where there were a lot more people in that stadium than the 25,000 allowed by all accounts, there was twice that in that lower ball, um, whether, it was the restrictions UF Health was putting on 
him being able to work with his team, be able to coach, keeping guys apart that maybe other states and other programs weren't adhering to. And it was making that much harder challenge to coach a team that Dan felt was a college football playoff team. That was a very, very good team in 2020. Mm-hmm. And they were all scattered for months, came back. Some guys were out of shape. Other guys had their own agenda at that point because week to week, they didn't know if the season was going to keep going. So mm-hmm. you had guys like a Marco Wilson, who I mentioned earlier. He, I mean, was he really bought into the team or was he bought into team Marco? Well, when he threw the shoe against LSU and cost him that game, look, the guy's starting in the NFL now for Arizona. Mm-hmm. So he clearly was a talent. Didn't play like it. So there was a lot of, I've mentioned a ton of things, but there was a lot of just challenges that Dan Mullen faced. And on top of it, the standalone facility Mm -hmm. would have been done by that then. It was delayed because of the COVID. Dan Mullen would have had that to recruit to. Maybe that would have like enlivened, energized him toward that part of the job that certainly was a necessary evil in his mind. That's interesting. Um, what, uh, what is this the year for Justin Shorter? Is this the year he finally breaks through? Because I feel like a lot's on his plate this year, and Florida fans are like, "This is, this is the time. This is, this is the year." Do you think it is for him? It needs to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, the kid was the number one recruit in 2018 at receiver, eighth in the nation overall. Went to Penn State, didn't really do much. I think he was dominant at the high school level because of his stature. He's a big kid. He's six mm-hmm. five ish. 225, 230, wins the ball in the air, strong physical kid. The problem with him is separating in coverage. Um, that's the problem with this entire receiver core. Trent Whittemore, nice route runner, good slot guy, not going to stretch the field on you usually. Um, mm. Xavier Henderson, who was a top 75 recruit out of Miami, C.J. Henderson's brother, does not have C.J. Henderson's speed. He doesn't really separate tremendously himself. They have some others that are in that kind of mold. Mm. So you really don't have, you know, the explosive guy on the edge that you kind of need. They got this Ricky Parasol Mm. from Arizona State who seems like a versatile playmaking guy. Is he going to be that explosive guy? I don't know that he has that explosive breakaway speed, but he certainly seems to have vision and have a knack. And they do give him the ball in various ways, running, maybe even throwing it a little bit. So he'll be kind of a Swiss Army knife guy. But back to Shorter, I mean, he's the leader of the group. I mean, fifth-year senior, um, he's the leading receiver returning from last season, and he works his tail off. There is no doubting that. Justin Shorter's mother, have you heard the story? Mm Mm-mm. Oh, my God. Justin Shorter's mother apparently throws him like 250 balls every morning before (laughs) he goes to school. And I'm like, I mean, it's a crazy story. I've been trying to interview his mom for like two years. I mean, she has a gun, apparently, and she's just tossing the ball to him 250 times. And he works his tail off at practice and after practice. So this guy is putting his hand on a football hundreds of times a day. It's like a guy one of these range rats like Ali Trevino at 500 balls a day or something. Mm -hmm. He is that kind of a guy, but does he have, does he have it? We'll see. He's a good piece to have, but Mm -hmm. is he a number one SEC receiver? I mean, he thinks he is, and he's going to have the chance to show it. He hasn't yet. Hmm. Well, we'll see. I am curious about that, but like, so the running games, it's funny. The Florida is just becoming like a silent, like just solid. They just keep putting in these running backs in the NFL. Like there, it's been a collection of guys uh, of late that have come through uh, Florida and did not put up eye popping stats at Florida, but everybody liked. And they were like, "Oh, this is an interesting guy." Whether it's P. Ryan or whoever, and they're just now NFL guys. But you have Montreal Johnson who comes in from Louisiana. He follows Billy Napier. Is he someone that was turning heads a little bit in the spring? Is he someone to watch that, like, this guy is probably not on anybody's radar yet, but Napier is going to use him a lot. Napier is going to maybe use him a lot to save Richardson from a lot of those runs to keep him healthy. He He's not uh, – he's on everyone's radar now, mm-hmm. for sure. Uh, he stood out in glimpses during the spring when we got the chance to watch a little bit, mm-hmm. and then he had a pretty nice spring game. I mean, it was like 13 and 55, nothing eye popping, but he showed balance. He showed power, Um, you know, vision. I mean, he Mm. showed the things you want to see. 
I don't know what kind of pass catcher he is. I like a pass catching element in my running backs personally. Damian Pierce really improved in yep. that aspect. I, in fact, it was a big selling point to the NFL was his ability to catch the ball, which was kind of crazy given he had rocks for hands when he first <laughs> got here. He worked hard at that. Mm-hmm. And uh, But the, intri- the intriguing part of this running backs room to me is more – Demarcus Bowman, the five hmm. star from Lakeland who went to Clemson, came here, did nothing yet. Mm-hmm. His knee in the spring before last season. So who knows what he was nursing there? Lorenzo Lingard, the recruit from Miami, Orange Chit City, Florida, which is an Orlando area, um, you know, town. Mm-hmm. He's an explosive kid and a physical specimen. I mean, just chisel. This kid looks like a world beater. Mm. But he hasn't done anything yet. Then you have Naquan Wright, who's shown a lot of wiggle and versatility and playmaking ability in spurts. Mm. So you've got a lot of options there. I don't know how you use them, how you deploy them, who you turn to, who gets the ball first. Um, A lot is going to come down to this offensive line once again. We've been talking about the offensive line question marks for years. Mm Mm-hmm. Going back to Montre, uh, what was it, Martez Ivy's recruitment in 15. It was like, okay, finally they got a five star stud, mm-hmm. number one recruit in the nation. Didn't pan out. I mean, he started a lot of games, but he was not a dominant offensive lineman, and those lines struggled often. The 18 line did a pretty good job. They had good offensive balance that year. I think it was 214, 213 pass run, but they have not been close to that kind of balance since then. And Napier wants balance, and he wants to run power football. Mm. This is going to be a different kind of football. This is not going to be, oh, yeah, let's light it up like Steve Spurrier. You realize Steve Spurrier's team scored 50 points more 48 times? That's astounding. His offenses, if you go look at the record books in Florida, I mean, just some of the numbers some of his offenses put up were astounding. Especially for the time in the era. Oh, he was amazing. We know that. Dan Mullen... Urban Meyer had some amazing offenses with Tim Tebow and Percy mm-hmm. Harvin, which would have been hard not to with those two guys, but still. And then Mullen, he put out some pretty good offense. And I'll tell you, that 2020 offense was special. Mm-hmm. With Pitts, Tony, Trask, Grimes. Um, you know, he did a nice job with P. Ryan and Scarlett in 2018 mm-hmm. with the balance team I mentioned. And 19, they had some nice offensive play. And P. Ryan, you know, showed his versatility catching the football a lot that year. Mullen was good at using his pieces. We'll see what Napier can do. I I think a lot of people are going to have to kind of change. Fans are going to have to kind of change their view of what is good football to watch with Napier potentially offensively. Mm -hmm. We'll see. But if it's winning football, they'll love it. Yeah, and we'll see how much it's interesting. We'll we'll see what the schedule, what they can do. But if Richardson's the guy, if Shorter pops this year, if Montreal Johnson and the Clemson transfer, if they pop, like there is a path to Florida being above, uh, finishing above expectations and then bouncing back. There is a path. It's not like there's a dearth of talent in Gainesville uh, for this fall. Like it's no. just. You just don't want to put this, these kind of crazy expectations on a year one coach. And it's just a totally different situation, different scheme, different staff. Um, it's a tough schedule. So we'll we'll see what happens there. Is there a position group for you uh, that you think that scares you the most heading into this fall? Is there like one that stands out as like, this is pretty on thin? Offense? Either, yeah. Well, to your point, though, I think the expectations on Billy are going to be fair because I think people do look at the schedule mm-hmm. and look at what Dan Mullen left because there was recruit recruiting um you know erosion let's mm. say as as time passed um I do think that the area I'd be most concerned about if I'm them is interior defensive line I mean hmm. John Dexter seems like he could be pretty good he's not a guy who's going to work well against double teams though you single up with him and he's pretty special and mm very talented kid. They need some guys to take, keep the flies off of him. I don't know who it is. I, I don't know who they have interior line wise. I should know um, a little bit more names, but just no one really emerged. I mean, it's like, you know, I'm looking, I wrote the Athlon preview um, for the Gators and I'm trying to see who we have in there. I mean, 
It's just like, you know, who lines up beside him is anyone's guess, I said. Now, mm. Brent Cox Jr. on the edge. Uh, another thing, I mean, they need someone else to kind of draw away all the attention. The mm-hmm. linebacking core has a few intriguing pieces. Ventrell Miller back for a sixth season because of shoulder injury. This Dewan Black kid who was a JUCO kid who was a 2019 signee who came through the JUCO ranks. He's pretty intriguing, man. This guy was a high school defensive back mm-hmm. early. He had 12 picks for 300 and some return yards and, and three pick sixes when he was a sophomore in high school. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's amazing numbers, like Ed Reed type stuff. And now he's our linebacker, and he gets his hand on the football a lot. He he makes his presence felt. They cornerback wise, you got Jason Marshall. I think he's trending. You got the Georgia transfer Jalen Kember intrigued there. Um, you know Kamari Wilson, the five star recruit. They kind of I don't want to say stole, but convinced to come here instead of Georgia at IMG. These are some potential pieces. You have some experience in trading Rashad Torrance, but it's they're just holes everywhere on that defense, but particularly that interior defensive line. And then on offense, my two concerns are where's your explosiveness playmaking, as I've stated, but also offensive line depth. The first unit offensive line might be pretty good, mm. but it's hard to keep everyone healthy on that unit. And it's, you know, they're just the, the margins are thin, man, with this team right now. Well, we'll see. We'll end on this, Edgar. What do you? What would you guess at the on the record this year? It is May twenty fifth, three eleven p.m. East Coast time. What uh, what record feels right to you for Florida year one? Well, I kind of stated it. I said the six and a half is a little low, but seven and a half feels right. I'd take the over on six and a half and mm. the under on seven and a half. <laughs> okay, that's a long way of saying seven and five. <laughs> yes, I said it a little while ago. Uh, Every, I, I see everything in a long way, if you haven't noticed. But I will say yeah. that seven wins, I think, would be acceptable by the yeah. fan base. It, it should, should be, be, yeah. But eight would be, people would be pretty happy, and nine ecstatic, and it's possible. But mm. I think nine's the ceiling. Mm. And I think six is probably the floor. So, okay. uh, yeah, but uh, w- let's see what he's got. Look, he, the t- The program... The players love this guy, Mm -hmm. and there's a lot to like. I really enjoy Billy Napier's thoughtfulness with answers. They're profound. I mean, you need to almost read his answers a second time on the transcript that we do Mm -hmm. as a group and go, oh, man, that was pretty deep. Um, He is – I'm going to read you this one thing, Chase, if I may indulge – if you may indulge me right here. Yeah, absolutely. This is one thing I'm going to read about Billy Napier. I have this, I have this actually in my notes file because I've shared it with a few people because mm. I like this a lot. He's talking about the Hawkins Center, which is the academic center. They mm. have a program, Gator Made. It's about life skills. Um, he's like, look, it's about, it's about a holistic approach. Mm. It's about leadership development and character education. It's about creating experiences for the players, so their perspective changes on life. Their approach changes as a student. We want to have a player where we're using football and football is not using them. Now, a lot of coaches say stuff like that. That Mm is most one of the most well-expressed ways to say what your mission is for your program that I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. Feels real. I believe it's real. I went to Chatsworth, Georgia, right after this guy was hired. It's his hometown. It's Mm -hmm. a small town, 13 miles east of Dalton. Yep. Perfect capital of the world. Oh, I know Chatsworth. I know. I I come through it uh, going back and forth from home, East Tennessee to to Atlanta. I know all about it. Yeah. It it is humble people. Yep. Farmers, educators, carpet mill workers. He came from humble roots. He was raised by a very, very... Um, you know, steadfast high school football coach who died ALS at age 60. Tragically, his father was sending scriptures to more than hundreds of people. I'm not religious. Hundreds of people a day were receiving a scripture or a positive affirmation from Bill Napier until the day before he died, five years later after getting ALS. This is the kind of person who raised Billy Napier. He is a 
upstanding, moral, extremely just resolute guy, a hard working mm. dude. So he has a lot going for him. Plus he worked under Saban five years and Dabo for several. He had no, he's seen success. I think the man's going to succeed, but people are going to have to be patient. There you go. Edgar, what can the good folks check out from you at the Orlando Sentinel this week? Well, I wrote a story, as I said today, I talked to Scott Strickland about what to expect next week in Destin. Um, I've been doing some Olympic sports stuff, but I actually took some time off. So football wise, a little thin. We're getting Billy tomorrow night before a booster event. And then I head to Destin Monday. So I hope people, uh, my, my Twitter handles OS Gators. Anyone who's interested in what's going on down here, give me a follow. There you go. And I'll look out to see if Billy uh, follows Saban's uh, way of going about it. And uh, shots fired in Knoxville, maybe, at Josh Heupel. Who knows? That's not how he operates, man. Don't hold your breath on that. <laughs> Edgar Thompson, thank you so much for making the time. I greatly appreciate it. We'll have to check back in again soon. It was fun. Thanks for having me, bud.